Hey Chuck, when it comes to sex, have you noticed there are two types of nice guys? Mm, no, tell me about it. All right, there's type one. At the okay. beginning, he gets lots of sex, everything is going well, and then something happens along the line, maybe after a few months or a year or so, it's the dead bedroom, right? So that's uh, type one. Yeah. What's the and other type? Type two, right? The guy, the nice guy type two, right? He's the one who gets no sex because he's ruined. Mm. Okay. Well, how about we do this? Let's talk about the five reasons why nice guys settle for bad sex on today's podcast. Do you ever wonder, why do I always seem to give so much more than I get? All I want is to be appreciated and loved. Is that asking too much? Why do all the jerks get the hot girls while I get stuck in the friend zone? When will it ever be my turn? If this sounds like you, you're in the right place. Welcome to The Nice Guy Show. This is the podcast that asks the question, how do I break free from the nice guy syndrome so I never have to come in last again? Now here are your hosts, Faisal Coker and Chuck Chapman. Hey guys, welcome to The Nice Guy Show. My name is Chuck Chapman. I'm here with my co-host, Faisal Coker. And we're going to talk about the five reasons why nice guys settle for bad sex. And if you're a nice guy, you probably know what I'm talking about. You know, where you you tend to just kind of like, you know, any sex is better than no sex and bad sex is, is, is like that kind of sex that just well, leaves you a little empty or like you're not getting any sex at all because you're a nice guy. And so we just want to talk about that and share our reasons why we feel uh, that the things that we've experienced in our relationships, the things we've experienced with maybe some of our clients um, and help you figure out what are the reasons you're settling for bad sex, but also what you can do to get better sex. So Faisal, as yeah, as as you were as you were talking about this, I was going, oh my god, I'm cringing about <laughs> some some of the stuff I've heard about sex and the struggles, and this is a big problem. This is a problem is. that not you know what not many people address. Is there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff that's hidden underground, and it'd be really <laughs> good to talk about some of the experiences that you know you know you and I've had. <laughs> Not together, of course. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong but, with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the experiences, you know, our clients have had and just sharing all those. All right. So let's talk about the top five reasons why nice guys mm -hmm. settle for bad sex. They have a really bad sex life, right? First of yeah. all, before we start this, Chuck. Yeah. Have you ever been in a situation where you've experienced not so nice sex? Not so great sex? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, like, um, <laughs> a lot of the sex that I had early on in my life while I, you know, before I worked on my nice guy stuff, I would say the vast majority of that was probably pretty bad sex. Yeah. How and about when you? When you said bad, yeah, okay, when you said bad, what do you mean by bad? What is, what does that mean? What is bad sex? Bad sex for me is sex where I'm not feeling a sense of connection where I'm not feeling like um, there's much point to it um, where it's, it's just less than satisfying, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's nice because we, we get into a relationship and it's really going well at first but then after a while, it just gets kind of dull and boring. And and then, you know, maybe she doesn't want to have sex. And so bad sex ends up being like no sex. And then you tend to just resolve yourself to, you know, doing what you've always done, hoping that things are going to change. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I know what what does mean. bad sex mean to you? It's like going to a really good restaurant. And then getting mediocre food. You know, that's what it's like. You know, you have this, you know, aesthetically pleasing person, or maybe you know you're attracted to, and then you know you you have all these expectations. Yeah. And then it's like, ah, oh, 
well, yeah, that was that was okay. And, you know, it might be something on your side, it might be something on her side, but it just leaves you with, like you said, there's a disconnect. It was like, mm. ah. So yeah. it's not, it's, it's that emotional feeling of when you feel like, oh, that wasn't a great meal, that wasn't a great sex. So mm -hmm. that's kind of bad sex too. So shall we have a look at the five reasons, the top five reasons yeah. why we think? Yeah. Okay, so the top five. Let's have a look top at number five. one. Number one. Right. So poor seducers and they're mechanical or boring. So nice guys are poor seducers and they're mechanical and boring. All right. So what does that mean? Like, a, what does it mean to be a poor seducer? Here's the thing. <laughs> this is my experience as well. Yeah. With nice guys, right? When it comes to attraction, when it comes to women, it's very logical. Hmm. It's it's very logical. It's very practical. There is no seduction, and I think I see this a lot. Men are losing the art of seduction. Men are losing the flavor, the taste, the richness of seduction. In my experience, women want to be seduced. Women, mm -hmm. if you look, if you read any erotic novel, you read any romance novel. Right? I don't know if you've read an erotic novel or not. Have you? I, I can, not, not that I can right. recall. I'll stop my. Okay, right. I'll send you, send you a few, okay. right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send it. Guys, if you want a copy, just send, send me a message. I'll send you a few, right? I recommend a yeah. few. And in the erotic novel, the whole thing about before they go to sex, before they go to bed, there's a whole kind of like story to it. There's kind of like, mm. there's a drama mm. that's unfolding, there's seduction, there's a story that's unfolding. When it gets to sex, yeah. For so us it's kind guys, of like the, the revving things up. It's it's the it's the like moving from point A to point B, but like you know, not just like like let's just get down to the you know the sex part. There's all that kind of like stuff before that builds up the juice and the anticipation and all that. Yeah, that absolutely. It's like yeah, yeah, it's like going to a restaurant and it's like right, here's my food. Select this, boom, boom, chuck it down, and then let's go. Yeah. That, sure. That's what. So that's what I mean by nice guys. How about you? What What do you think? Uh, well, the, I think I think kind of like nice guy one on one here is that we want to be seen as nice guys. We want to be seen from all the other men, uh, seen different from all the other men, right? Yeah. Um, we don't want to be seen as that jerk who's just you know he's just out for sex, right? And so we come into a relationship pretending like. We don't really want sex. We're not like all the other guys. Hoping that what will happen is that she will see me as, as being like different and, and want to have sex with me because I'm a different kind of guy. I don't just want sex. But the reality is, is that I do want sex, you know? Yeah. And it's funny because I think, you know, when you go and approach a woman, she knows that the reason Why you're did? approaching her is because you want to have sex eventually, right? You want to see and her naked. <laughs> you want to see her naked. And yet we go and we pretend like, oh, no, that's not me. I'm not that kind of guy, you know. Like, and, and then because we show up as, you know, a different kind of guy who doesn't just want sex all the time, what ends up happening is we get into a relationship where there isn't a lot of sex and it's not happened a lot of times. And I think that comes from an internalized fear of rejection. You know, nice guys are terrified of rejection. So if I go out there and I say, hey, you know, you know, try to go through the seduction process or, you know, be romantic, what have you, yeah. is that she's going to see us as being a jerk, right? And is going to reject us because we're just like every other guy. And... So our fear is that we're going to get rejected. And so we don't come to the table, so to speak, with our card showing. Instead, we pretend like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not like all the other guys. And yeah. that's, that, that is how I was for the vast majority of my. Um, me too. <laughs> seduction I've, phase yeah, of my I've, life. I've, <laughs> I've done the same thing. It's so embarrassing because she instinctively, right, from, from evolution psychology, she knows 
why you're talking to her. That's what we designed for. So you're mm -hmm. going there with the premises of, oh, you know what? I'll, I don't want sex and I don't want to, you know, let her know the real reason why I'm talking to her because come on, let's, let's be direct and let's be honest here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If she wasn't attracted, if you weren't attracted to her, chances are you're not going to go and talk to her. If she was like, you know, 500 pounds, not the greatest looker, last thing you'll be doing right is not going to be approaching her. So let's just get real here. <laughs> and the reason why you're approaching her, because you do want to see her naked. You do want to have sex with her. You are attracted to her. Own it. So a lot mm -hmm. of nice guys have this disconnect. and But she knows mm -hmm. the reason why. You, and I think that's why she builds this distrust. That's why she rejects it more. Because you're coming with, with an intention of wanting to know me, not for more than just a, the conversation or the, what you're selling, but you're pretending you don't. So she always feels this instinctual dist, uh, distrust. I've done this so many times. You know, I'll, I remember because I was a tech nerd. <laughs> so my seduction skills were, hey, let me fix your machine. Does your computer have any mm. problems? <laughs> right. Yeah. That was that. Yeah. Come on. This I'll get was, the bugs out. Yeah. I'll get that. <laughs> this was like technical support 101. Do you have any problems? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Is that hard drive having some problems there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my some of my seduction skills. I would use trying to fix her hmm. as a way to seduce her. So what changed? How do you how do you approach someone now? Like when if you're you know, you're a single guy, so you approach w women. And, um, like, how do you, how do you change that? How do you turn that around? So I'm very direct. It's not yeah. like, hey, I want to sleep. You with want to go sleep with me? It's, yeah, yeah. It's I would start flirting. I would start to have intentional flirting. I will see if there's any feedback, then I'll add, mm. you know start to amplify the flirting. Whereas, whereas before, I wouldn't amplify the flirting. I would make it very sensual or sexual. I just keep it very friends, and uh, she knows that we're having fun. But you know, I would just keep it at that pace. Oh, I wanted to go towards sex, and also I didn't know how to handle it. And there was, mm. there was a lot of stuff that you know we can definitely talk about in some of the other reason. So we've got fear of rejection, right? Fear of so, rejection—that's huge. That's it's probably the number one reason why I think we have a hard time approaching women. Yeah. So fear of rejection. Or doing most, most things in our life come, come around because we're, we're afraid of being rejected. Yeah. And I don't want to upset her. I don't want her to reject me. If I say something, here's the thing. Nice guys, they're so laid back or as in passive that they don't want to push that as soon as they feel like they've heard so many times in the world that, oh, these bad boys, these jerks, they're so pushy. So when they hear that message, I don't want to be that jerk. I don't want to be that pushy. I want to be the separate guy. So then I won't have to face any rejection. So Chuck, here's another reason, right? And this kind of follows on from, you know, I don't want to be like the other guys. I don't want to be pushy. Reason number two, right? Afraid to lead and be dominant. Nice guys mm. are afraid to lead and be dominant. And they don't want to get rejected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that that, Again, nice guys, their number one fear is, is I'm not lovable, acceptable, just the way that I am. So if I bring any kind of sexual energy or kind of maybe like, like some, some dark sexual energy that I'm going to get rejected, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be shamed for wanting to have the desire for having sex. And, and I think it's a really important piece that, that I've learned anyway, is that you have to bring some dark energy into the Ooh. into the bedroom and what by dark that? energy yes. i'm not talking i'm just talking like you know it's like the, it's the it's the taboo it's like just kind of touching on the 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 things that are maybe a little taboo or risque or something like that you know you know okay, that so titillating feeling that you get yeah so it's not sex like, with the lights off not that kind just of not sex with the lights off exactly <laughs> right. yeah yeah right. yeah that if you you've, you've got to bring that in because if you you know, sex without a little bit of dark energy is like a, is like music without a bass line. You know, there's just that underlining tone. You don't really hear the bass so much as you feel it, and you just kind of you right. know, comes together. It's food it's without it's, it's food without spices, right? This is what yeah, it is. yeah, no yeah, salt. yeah. So yeah. you got to bring some darkness into it. Kind of like edge. This, this the edge, yeah. You just kind of bring a little bit of edge, right? Yeah. You literally got to bring your balls to it. 
<laughs> Excuse the <Okay>. pun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. So dark. So dark energy. What else? What else do we need to bring to be to lead and to be dominant? Because nice guys are afraid of this. Well, again, because we're afraid of rejection, we will oftentimes let her take the lead, and and and, and that may actually makes a lot of sense in sort of the you know current environment, like the the Me Too and the you know getting sexual consent and all of that type of stuff that guys can be kind of afraid of like, you know, moving too fast or moving forward um, in a way that, uh, you know, she doesn't feel safe. But we also have to um, be assertive because when we're not, what happens is we're, instead of being assertive, we're receptive. And whenever you're in the receiving mode, you're in more of a passive place. And she, uh, the, I think the women that I've talked to and, you know, have had experiences with in the past are women, you know, they want you to be assertive, you know, not to be yes, like too oh, right. They do. Yeah. But, but they want you, they want you to take the lead and, and us nice guys, we tend to be afraid of taking the lead again because we're afraid of being rejected. And so we sit there sort of passively hoping that, you know, she's going to take the lead. And I think when, when we do that, um, you know, we get upset because she's not doing what we want her to do. Actually, that, that reminds me of a, a, a time when I was being intimate and this is, you know, after my nice guy recovery. And uh, so we're intimate, we're having, you know, we, we're really getting down with it. And I remember we're talking dirty as well, right? So I'm talking yeah. dirty. I'm, I, women love this, by the way. And uh, <laughs> not all, but I know a lot of women do, right? Yeah. So we're talking about yeah. it. Yeah. So we're talking and, you know, it's getting very intense and it's getting very sexual and it's getting arousing. And I'm pushing and I'm pushing, I'm pushing to the edge. And I got to a place where it was too much for her. Mm. And then she said, ah, you know what? I don't like that. Mm. And so one of the things I, I rem remember before I would have been, oh my God, I said something really bad and I'm really horrible. I'm, mm. I'm wrong for this. And I would have shut down. Yes. Yeah. I would have shut down because I'm just like, okay, this is bad. I shouldn't dominate. I shouldn't be pushing mm -hmm. like this. And, th and that, I remember in the past that kind of one experience would have just made me very passive, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yes, but on this occasion, I kind of realized, okay, you know what? This is what I call the temperature, the buying temperature. I was like, okay, that was too hot to handle. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. was about turning it down, is but like really attuning with the person. I didn't take it personally. That's the reason a lot of you know I would have done that before. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, cool. Now we just need to literally cool down a little bit, climatize. And then at some point, if it does, if it feels natural, we'll continue. Yeah. 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 I think that's a great point because it's oftentimes what nice guys tend to do is we tend to get hurt and we shut down and then, you know, it's kind of an all or nothing kind of thing. And, but I think what you did there where you're able to reframe it for yourself in, in the immediate of just like, okay, let's turn the temperature down a little bit here. Um, you know, it's good that she's letting you know what she wants and what she doesn't want, you know? Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. It's all and about we had, we had, like, communicating in that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had that conversation Dr. Glover talks about as well. So I had that, you know, conversation and I keep it to the forefront. Um, mm. but we definitely dive into that one. All right. So becoming passive and also nice guys hate tension, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I felt a lot of tension there. And I felt like, oh my God, I, this is, I've done something wrong. But when I right. realized it was just a little bit too much, I eased off. Yeah. Right. So yeah. why do nice guys hate tension? How, and why is it such a bad thing? Well, I think, you know, nice guys get uncomfortable when there's any kind of tension. And, and yet on the flip side of that, tension is something that we need it in order to feel excitement and connection and all, you know, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you go to a, if you go to a game, a football game or something like that, and the score is 
you know, it's a shutout. It's just blows, you know, one team blows the other team away. It's not a very interesting game. But if it's really tight, you know, and it's down to the end and there's overtime or whatever, you know, that that tension that builds in between that is about what's creating the excitement of, you know, seeing, okay, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? But nice guys tend to shut that down. And whenever we kill tension, we're killing the attraction because, we as humans, we need to have some kind of tension, some sort of interplay that, you know, that kind of back and forth uh, flow that happens. Um, and if you're just a couch potato and you sit on the couch and eat chips and watch Netflix <laughs> and, you know, all that, there's no tension. And that's really safe. It's a safe place to be. But it's also not very exciting, you know. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, we want to have great sex and yet we're not really willing to enter into the space of creating a little bit of tension and a little bit of fun and a little bit of banter um, a little bit of drama if a little, little bit of drama yeah th there has to there has to be i mean you look at any uh, uh rom-com or romantic movies right it's not mm -hmm. plain hey guy and girl they they meet together they have a nice time and then they get married and they have kids. No, it's not like that. You know, they meet the guy. There's always kind of some kind of problem. There's conflict. There's some kind of like uh, right. something that pulls them, something that pulls them together. And then at some point in the movie, early on, there's something that, mm -hmm. you know, pushes them away. To, and then they fight to come back together. Yeah. And that's most yeah. of the, the kind of the journey, romantic journeys. And you see that in, in the books as well, mm -hmm. in erotic books. Mm -hmm. brings them together, pushes them away. So there is tension. I call it, um, for example, when you're driving a car, uh, as the tire grips the tarmac, the more grip there is, the faster the car goes around corners and the more thrilling and the fun that it is. Yes. Imagine a Formula One racing or any kind of motor racing. If they had no traction, they'll be just going off, or off the place. Right? Right. It yeah. won't be exciting. It won't be thrilling. So nice guys... Mm -hmm avoid tension and that kills section attraction and chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Reason number three is a big one and that's sexual shame. You know, and sexual shame leads to things like performance anxiety. It leads to things like, um, you know, feeling bad after having sex. Um, it feels Sexual shame leads to feeling bad for not having sex. Um, and it's really at the core of the nice guy. The nice guy's belief is I'm not okay just the way that I am. I'm not lovable, acceptable the way that I am. And that is shame. Sh the difference between shame and guilt is guilt is I did something that I need to correct. And shame is there's something wrong with me. I am the thing that's wrong. And a lot of nice guys that I've worked with, myself included, we carry a lot of sexual shame. And I think it would be a good point to kind of bring up here as well is that, you know, when we're talking about good sex, you need to have two healthy people in a relationship in order to have good sex. And a lot of times nice guys get into relationships with uh, individuals and partners who have sexual trauma in their background, they have sexual abuse in their background. Um, and they haven't worked through it. They haven't done the work necessary to kind of heal in those areas. I think a lot of times that's nice guys. We have sexual trauma in our background um, and we haven't healed from that as well. I know some of the clients I've worked with in the past, you know, they will have an experience where, you know, they're having a difficult time maybe, in, you know, with a, with a partner or a new partner or something like that. And then the partner gets angry with them or, and, and that just kind of creates within in them you know, more of that shame. And then that tends to show up when they are with a new partner or something, you know, is that, oh my gosh, it's going to happen again. And she's going to reject me. And I, I've heard that type of story uh, multiple, multiple times with the, the guys that I work with, that there's some sort of sexual trauma that they've experienced um, that is creating their own disconnect in being able to bring their own, you know, their, their, their presence to, to that sexual experience. Yeah. So the idea of, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not big enough. I don't last long enough. I last too long. You know, all those kind of things come into play 
and then we don't really enjoy enjoy sex. I think another thing is a lot of the nice guys I've worked with have some kind of uh, belief system. A rel- either they grew up religious or they grew up in a family system where you know sex was uh, maybe sex wasn't talked about or oh, sex was shameful. Yes. You know, in those ways, sex was bad or you know, and um, and so that just kind of adds to that sexual shame of okay, there must be something wrong with me because I want to have sex, you know? And it's not talked to, did you ever find it's it? It's not talked it, about. It's not. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have that parent conversation. Uh, you know, my, my parents didn't co- uh, talk about sex and sex, anything related with sex was like, in my family was like, no, we don't talk about it. Yeah. 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 We, we don't. We... Yeah. We don't talk about it or it's, you know, the only reason you have sex is to have children or that, you know, you don't have sex until you're married. Um, yeah. But it, it becomes a thing because it's not talked about. And you know, when you're a teenager and you're going through, you know, hormones and ch- body changes and all that kind of stuff. And you're just like a big ball of sexual energy and it's not talked about, you know, the conclusion that you come to is there must be something wrong with me. Right. Okay. It does. And and you have all of these emotions and feelings and you're thinking, well, I can't internalize them. I can't, uh, you know, make sense of them. There is no one to talk about to make sense of them. Now, you know, you, of course, when you're a teenager, you have questions and you end up going at the wrong places for those questions. So I can see that in my, in my, especially in my culture as well. Yeah. You don't talk about yeah. it. Yeah. It's only so one of the, I think machine. one of the things. <laughs> to people. One well, of the things they only missionary really, sex, the only missionary <laughs> sex, right? That's it. Yeah. Lights off, boom, right, boom. Let's talk about reason number four, which is too much porn and masturbation. We're going to talk about shame, right there. We're going to talk about masturbation and porn. You know, there's a there's a lot of shame around those two areas, but there's also a problem with those two things that, that they add to you know a settling for bad sex. What's your experience around this with maybe uh, the guys that you work with or even your own experience? Yeah, for, well, I'll, I'll cover both sides as well. So this was a huge problem. And, you know, when when you keep something hidden, dark, mm-hmm. right? This is what shame is. Shame is about you know, the belief I'm not, you know, good enough. And what shame thrives on, what shame grows on is darkness and secrecy. And there's a lot of secrecy around porn, masturbation, and sexual desires. And for a lot of the guys, that's what they did was they kept it very quiet because they don't want to be caught or seen. And for me, that was the same thing. I, you know, I went towards porn. And it was something I did on a regular basis, my porn and masturbation, and it consumed me. And it and I noticed that it was wasting a lot of my time, a lot of my energy, my focus. And I didn't realize it was a problem. It was something that I thought I got a pleasure out of it. I just did it. Mm-hmm. I never mm-hmm. saw it as a problem. But all I did was I felt guilty about it. And, I, and at that point... I thought, okay, this is wasting a lot of time. But then there was another part of me that was like, okay, well, it's a pleasurable thing. I'm enjoying it. I enjoy the porn. I enjoy the masturbation. But there was like a, a double-edged sword, guilt and then pleasure. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing that can happen with porn and masturbation is it starts to set sort of like false expectations, but also false comparisons. You know, if you're comparing yourself oh, to yeah. the guy in the porn uh, movie, you know, or, the, you know, the, the way that women operate, you know, it gives you a false idea of what sex is and what sex is about. And that, um, and, and, and it gives you a false idea of what sex is about, which then creates anxiety in yourself of, well, if I'm not a porn star, if I'm not having sex like this, there must be something wrong with me. Um, or that, you know, women should be a certain way, like the way that I see them in the, you know, in in the porn videos and things. Um, but it also tends to 
screw with our neurochemistry uh, and our ability to <laughs> connect with yeah, to connect with um, other people and our partners because when you're um, you know sex is when you have an orgasm it's one of the times that you have a, a neurochemical a hormone called oxytocin is released and that's the chemical that we call it the love chemical it's the it's the thing that makes you feel bonded to another person and if your brain is continuously having sex with people that you don't know or just these images on the screen you stop producing that oxytocin so, because and and so when you do have a partner it's much harder to attach to that partner and feel secure and safe with that partner because your brain isn't used to producing the oxytocin that it would be if you weren't having sex with you know and in in the brain's mind you know thousands of people so it's a and it's an important aspect of uh the way that I'm going to create a relationship that is successful in the future is that I have to be able to attach. And in order for me to attach, I have to have this chemical oxytocin. And when we have sex with, um, you know, fewer people or one, one person, then we're able to attach to that person. And otherwise, is feel becoming, a sense of otherwise is it becoming mechanical? Is that and then it starts to become mechanical. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, yeah, there's no, there's none of that connection. It's just, it's just like a bodily function. It's like a sneeze or something, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's just, a, it's, I suppose it's like, it's, it becomes like masturbation sex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's masturbation. And I've had, I've had girls, um, really say, you know, sometimes the, when they're guys who's heavy on porn use and masturbation use, you know, he has it very uh, in that disconnected way, but in a very mechanical way. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't feel him. She he, he, she feels like he doesn't care. He doesn't want to yeah. connect. He just wants to use her, right? And then be done it. And there's no aftercare. There's no more. Yeah. Uh, you know, attuning to her what she right. needs. Right? He'll either people please, or he'll be really <laughs> pleasing to her and completely disconnect from it. Exactly. Exactly. And. And what porn does oftentimes is it will create the other person as an object, okay, as opposed to another human being, you know, so this is just something I'm having sex with, you know, I don't have any care about this object that I'm having sex with. I'm just using that. And we forget that the person that we're having sex with is a person, a human being, an individual, somebody who has, you know, emotions and thoughts and feelings and um, experiences and, um, and, and, and when we see somebody as an object rather than a human, then we fail to connect with them. And when we fail to connect, then it just becomes, you know, it's like, you might as well be having sex with a chair. <laughs> you know, um, there's, it is when it becomes very mechanical, there's also, you know, I, I've got work with clients in their past relationships. What they've had is very, uh, they've had a the dead bedroom and because when mm -hmm. they've had a the dead bedroom what happens is they kind of program in the time to have sex or it'll be like oh okay well she kind of feels like it's like an obligation sex mm -hmm. right might as well do this i know he wants sex let's just do it and he's feeling really crap about it but he just picks up the crumbs anyway and says, right, this is the best I'm going to get. So I might as well mm. just do this. And she's already feeling obliged to give him sex. And he's feeling, well, I don't know it happens very often. I don't know how to get this. And now she's offering it. I'm just going to take it. So there's a yeah. whole disconnect there. And this is it. This, this, it's just very mechanical and obligated. Well, and I think that's kind of the point of sex is to create connection, you know, because I think that if you think about sex and like if if we are physical, emotional, and spiritual beings, right, that's the one place that we connect in all three of those places. And that's what creates intimacy. But if you're just connecting on the physical, you know, and not the emotional or spiritual level, you're not getting as much out of sex as you could be if you were really connecting in all three of those areas. And okay. that's what I believe well, intimacy is. 
Yeah. What about some? Okay. Sometimes you're in, you're a night out. You're really horny, right? And right. I don't want to do the whining, the dining, the whole thing. You know, you have your little one night stands because you're horny. Some, you know, and guys, there's a lot of shame around this as well. Like, oh, don't be a user. Don't be this. Don't mm. be, you know, you're a fuck boy. All of these comments. Mm. Come on. They are women, right? Especially when they're so get to a certain age, they are as bad as the men. They want to just see the guy fuck and just have friends with benefits and gone. And, and sometimes I, I've been in that guy. I've left, left there going, is that it? I feel really used. I feel like me. And you just mm-hmm. hit it and quit it. <laughs> right. So I've been on that both side as well. But I know for, you know, guys, when they go more into the masculine side, the primal side, they can be, you know, sex done. It's not too much. Con- you know, there's no, they don't always feel that connection. Mm-hmm. But I mm-hmm. guess when they're, that's more of like a short term mating strategy. When they have long term mating strategy, yeah, the connection, the intimacy has to start to build up for it to mean something. Otherwise, the dead bedroom happens and she starts pulling away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So too much porn, too much ma- masturbation kills you, leaves you with no desire. And I also see that when it comes to dating. They, the guys don't want to go out dating. The whole point of sex and sexual energy is to get you moving mm. towards the mate to, to create something. When guys just have too much porn and masturbation, they just become very passive and use the internet sometimes to, you know, DM girls, sure. message girls. Yeah. But they're not actually going out when they could be using that energy to meet and yeah. connect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just easier to sit in on the on the couch than it is to you know actually go out and create connections. All right, let's have a look so, at number five. Right. Seeking validation from sex. Yeah, that's a big one, I think. I think I think guys tend to measure success based on whether or not they're having sex. So sex becomes the goal, right? And the goal then is, well, if I had sex with her, that validates me as a man, right? Um, You know, guys typically, you know, sort of the locker room talk, it's all about bragging. It's all about the conquerors. It's all about that kind of thing. And the reality is, is that it's not the sex that's important. It's the validation that we get from the sex that we find is important. And whenever you give someone the power to validate you, you inadvertently give them the power to invalidate you. So if sex is the goal, because if she has sex with me, then I'm validated as a man. I must be important. I must be, you know, uh, you know, be macho or whatever. When she doesn't want to have sex with me, then that means the opposite is true. I'm not okay. Mm. And so when we seek sex as a form of approval or a form of of validation, it's a double-edged sword because if I get sex, okay, that feels really good, but I'm not really thinking about sex. I'm thinking more about like how that makes me feel as, you know, validated. Um, Whereas it's a big measuring. It it is a big, I was about to say big measuring tool. (laughs) (laughs) For guys, it is right. So when the guys had, when you know, when you ask, oh, you want, did you go on a date? Yeah, did you guys, you know, fuck. And for the guys, they want to know like, how many girls have you slept with? How many? It, it is a numbers, numbers. It is. There's, there's, there's a lot of focus on numbers, right? And right. did you make her come? Did she? How many times? Right. Did she come? Yeah, she right. didn't come. Oh my god, right. that's it. I'm, I'm bad. I'm awful at right. this. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure, and then it adds back to the Both sexual shame, which backs to the anxiety, which adds to the bad sex. It is, it is, and you know, and I there's pressure on both sides because there are some women who take a little bit longer to warm up, and and it takes them it takes them the right environment to have an orgasm. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not just just the guy, but it takes them. The guy has to create the situation where she has the orgasm, so she feels pressured, and he's going. You know, why isn't she coming so quickly? Some of the other girls may do. I've had partners where some of them, you know, came very quickly and some 
never. Mm. I'm thinking, is it me? What's wrong with me? <laughs> right? And then she's <laughs> thinking, she can feel that from me and she can feel the pressure. And there's a tension between it. And because of the shame, there's no conversation about it. Right, right, right. And that's, I think you hit it right there. The, the, the key to the dead bedroom, the key to settling for bad sex is you have to start talking about sex outside of the bedroom. You have to start dealing with your own shame that comes up for you because, you know, well, if I talk about sex, then I might be rejected or she might, you know, might, might, might complain, those kind of things. But the, the key is in the thing that you're avoiding. And the thing that we avoid probably the most is talking about sex in our relationship with our partner and talking to our partner about the sex that we're experiencing, the sex that they're experiencing, yeah. and really normalizing the conversation about sex. Similarly to like, you know, if she may, you know, if you made a meal and, and, and like, what do you think of the meal? Oh, it was really good. You know, maybe next time we get out a little bit of this or, or maybe next time we'll put, take a little bit of that out or something like that. Or maybe this would go really good with this. There's no, you know, fear of rejection or anything like that. We're just talking about the, the food that we made. If we could talk about sex at that level where there is no charge to it, instead it's just like, oh yeah, let's talk. Let's try that next time. That would be fun. Let's try that, you know. That takes that, a lot of that does take a lot of connection, doesn't it? It takes a lot it of It does. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of respect for each other and also a lot of open and directness and, and being able and to take feedback. Just yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's yeah, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, you know, with that, the the woman who's, you know, said that was too much. It's like, instead of shutting down about that, all right, let's have a conversation about that. You know, let's let's debrief on what's going on for you. I just, you know, or, you know, you find out you need to find in a whole lot about your partner by having those kind of conversations. Yep, yep. And, and that's, the, here's what I find is I've been with some girls where, They've had sexual trauma in the past. You know, they end up crying. They end up uh, shutting down. And mm -hmm. and what would happen was I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, what have I done wrong? It's not necessarily what I've done wrong. It's necessarily sometimes it could be what's, you know, obviously I need to check that in too, but also what's yeah. ex what their experience is. What what's their experience? With. Yeah, mm -hmm. what, they, what they're coming. They're bringing something to them. And I realized some of the girls that I have been with, they had some – kind of sexual trauma in their past mm -hmm. that yeah came up for them and and she said when it, when things like have come in the past the guy didn't know how to handle it most guys right. don't know how to handle it and they take it personally right. they get offended right. by it or they think oh my god this is something wrong we can't fix this mm -hmm. so rather than actually like you said having a conversation about it like adults they Mm -hmm. bury underneath it, you know, they bury away. That's it. I don't want to talk about it. It's shame. And the next time they approach it, they know there's an issue, but it doesn't get talked about. Absolutely. Well, there's so much here to unpack and so much here, you know, this is, we're just, we're just tapping on the surface here of why nice guys settle for bad sex, but we hope you have enjoyed this podcast about the five reasons why nice guys settle for bad sex. So Faisal, what are we going to talk about? on our next show well i don't know i i really can't tell you but i think we should definitely talk about it and i expect it to be at a certain level and standard for our next conversation but if it's not done then i'm gonna be upset i'm gonna get angry and i'm gonna be bitter and resentful about it so you want me to know what you're going to talk about but you're not going to tell me what you're going to talk about nope and if i show up and I'm not ready, you're going to be angry with me. That yep. sounds like a covert contract. Let's talk about covert contracts. Covert contracts, everybody. So join us on our next show, next episode. We're going to talk about covert contracts. What are they? Why do we use them? And how do we stop using those buggers in our life? Thanks for tuning in. And we will see you next time on The Nice Guy Show. Until the next time. Take care, guys. You've been listening to The Nice Guy Show the podcast that helps nice guys move past their insecurities and fears into the fullness of their masculine strength and confidence. 
Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast and check out the website niceguyshow.com for more information on how to connect with Chuck and Faisal. Until next time, keep living your best life. Thank you.